Well, uh, welcome. My name is uh, uh, John Berzerot. I'm the director of the Reese Institute for Conservation of Natural Resources at Lenore Rhine uh, University. And I'm here with uh, Roy Cardato uh, from the John Locke Foundation. And uh, I want to th uh, thank the John Locke Foundation for uh, helping sponsor uh, this event and also to the people at the Convention Center as well for uh, helping uh, set this up and for, for the, all the film crews that are here as well. Um, you notice when you came in on your seats there was uh, an agenda for tonight's event and then there's also a card from the uh, John Locke Foundation. If you are interested in the Locke Foundation, uh, please fill that out and pass it to the center of the aisle. There's also a survey form uh, on uh, global climate change and, and issues related to energy, so we would ask you also to fill that out and as you do, pass that to the center aisle as well. And then finally, you'll find an index card and uh, you'll be able to use that for uh, writing questions down for uh, the speakers that will happen at the end of our program. So I'm very happy uh, to welcome you to Hickory um, and I'm uh, really honored to be here and to introduce the speakers. Um, uh, our first speaker for the night is uh, Dr. William Schlesinger, and Dr. Schlesinger is the president of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem S uh, Studies, um, and before coming to the Institute, he served a dual capacity as, uh, at Duke University as both the James B. Duke Professor of Biogeochemistry and the Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences. He has degrees from Dartmouth College and Cornell University and has been investigating the link between environmental chemistry and global climate change for over 30 years. Uh, Dr. Schlesinger is the author or co-author of over 180 scientific papers. His textbook, uh, Biogeochemistry Analysis of Climate Change, is a widely uh, taught textbook at the university level. He's an elected member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's also uh, the past, past president of the Ecological Society of America and the Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow. Uh, our other speaker is Dr. John Christie, and he is a professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at the University of Alabama uh, at Huntsville, where he began studying global climate uh, issues since 1987. Uh, Dr. Christie received both his master's and PhD degrees in atmospheric sciences from the University of Illinois. Um, in 1989 with uh, Dr. Roy Spencer, uh, uh, Dr. Christie developed a global temperature data set from microwave data observed from satellites beginning in 1979. For this achievement, um, the Spencer Christie team was awarded NASA's Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement. Dr. Christie has served as a contributor um, and lead author um, for the UN reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, he has or is serving on five National Research Council panels or committees and has performed research funded by NASA uh, NOAA, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Transportation. Uh, so uh, our, um, each speaker will be given 20 minutes to uh, present their view of the global climate change issues. Um, both speakers will then be given 10 minutes to respond or a comment um, uh, to their fellow scientist. Uh, we will then take a, a short break, at which point we'll collect your questions and uh, uh, finally, the speakers will respond to your questions in the, in the last uh, part of the uh, program. And if you uh, have a question for a particular speaker, you could put their name at the top of your question, or you might be uh, just asking a general question uh, for um, either of the speakers. So uh, we'll go, get, go ahead and get started, and Dr. Schlesinger will uh, begin. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me here tonight. I know that uh, climate change has been a big issue in the election uh, last fall. It's a major issue facing the state with its uh, North Carolina Commission on Climate Change that is uh, uh, trying to work out what the, the state of North Carolina should do uh, about the issue. Uh, I hope that uh, 2009 is really the turning point when we go from talk about whether this is, is an issue uh, to whether uh, and what we can do about the issue. 
uh, the American Geophysical Union uh, just this year published a, a compilation of, of the belief of scientists and the public uh, on climate change and whether it was due to humans uh, that showed more than 90 percent of the climate scientists in this country, publishing climate scientists in this country, uh, have no difficulty uh, saying that uh, the, the earth is warming and at least a significant fraction of it is due to uh, human activities. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that I hope that we are not treating an unhealthy patient uh, that is our planet, uh, hoping that we don't have to make any uh, uh, drastic action, surgery or whatever, that, that one last blood test will show uh, that we've been wrong. Uh, I think we're beyond that point. I think we really have to begin to think uh, about the kinds of actions that we will take on this problem. So I want to give us five things that I think that I see reasonable agreement on in the scientific community. Uh, I don't find anybody uh, that doubts that carbon dioxide is rising in Earth's atmosphere uh, today and that it started to do so at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s. Started off at about 270 parts per million in the atmosphere, and today I would take a guess that as we started this program, it was about 385 parts per million uh, in the room. So it's gone up by roughly a third of the content uh, that's in the room. I don't think there's anybody that doubts that carbon dioxide is one of a suite of gases that we call greenhouse gases and that the concentrations of them in the atmosphere warm planets, not just planet Earth, but, but any planet that we know uh, something about. Water vapor is another one, methane is another one. Uh, we should all be thankful that there's a certain natural level of these gases in the atmosphere. Uh, without the natural or background level, the temperature of planet Earth in its orbit around the sun would be the, below the freezing point of water. Uh, oceans would be frozen from top to bottom. We wouldn't be here as higher forms of life discussing this tonight. Uh, so there's a natural greenhouse effect uh, that really shouldn't concern us too much. Uh, what we really want to focus our attention is whether we're changing the greenhouse effect by increasing the concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. I think we can all agree from a variety of lines of work that in fact the Earth has been getting warmer in the last few decades. Uh, we see this in data out of the National Data, uh, National, uh, data Center for Climate in, in Asheville. Uh, we see it in satellite records of, of the Earth. Uh, we see it in the early migration patterns of birds arriving every spring. Uh, up in New York State, we see it in the record of the temperature in the Hudson River for the last 60 years. All of these show an increase in temperature. Uh, there are different ways of looking at it, some with thermometers, some with birds telling us uh, what thermometers might otherwise tell us, uh, but they all show the planet uh, warming. We see breakup of ice, the sea ice in the Arctic, uh, and uh, ice shelves in Antarctica, some of which are 10 to 15,000 years old. So this looks like uh, something new to the planet in the polar region. The warming that we record seems to be strongest at the poles at night during the winter. That's exactly where the climate models say it should be, and also consistent with the idea that it's the loss and the blockage of loss of heat radiation out of planet Earth rather than changes in the sun's input uh, that make a difference. And I think we could all, or we'd find a vast majority of the scientific community agree that the Earth has changed temperature and has changed carbon dioxide in the past. Uh, there's been fluctuations of these markedly in the last two million years during the glacial interglacial period. No question about that. But in the last eight to 10,000 years, which spans the entire record of humans living in organized society, that is with language, culture, transportation, money, uh, largely living in cities, uh, that the climate has been remarkably stable, and until the Industrial Revolution uh, began, uh, the carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere was remarkably stable. So a whole lot of science is done. Are we finished with the science? Uh, not at all. The climate models we have today will undoubtedly be replaced with newer and better climate models tomorrow and 10 years from now. 
just as the nightly weather forecast that you see and plan what you're going to wear tomorrow is much better than it was 10 or 20 years ago because the daily weather maps and the models that produce and predict those maps uh, have improved during the interval. So there's no question there is science that remains to be done. Uh, but I would argue that it is well past the point of time when we ought to be taking some action on this uh, feverish patient, namely our planet, uh, and move forth with some policies. I feel so strongly that that science is done that I want to spend most of my time tonight talking about some of the impacts on climate that we might expect. I'm going to skip over a few early slides here that I basically uh, have told you about already and move right to some uh, pictures of impact. This is one of several models of what the world's climate will look like uh, in slightly more than a decade from now, the decade 2020 to 2030 compared to today. Areas that are predicted to be warmer than the present are shown here in increasing browns, uh, orangish browns, up to 2 degrees centigrade or 4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. And you see a broad swath of that warming predicted for Canada, Alaska, uh, Scandinavia, and, uh, and Russia. You also see an onset of warming down in high southern latitudes. There's a variety of models out there. They differ degree, and they, you can look in, and see individual differences uh, between them. But for the most part, they all show the same general pattern, and they show a magnitude of warming uh, that is relatively similar. Notice that the warming is seldom uh, predicted and very little seen along the equator here. Uh, it's seen at these high latitudes. Here's North America, South America, Africa, Australia. What kind of impacts can we expect this to have? When we look at, uh, for instance, uh, Antarctica uh, and the Antarctic ice sheet, where there's, of course, penguins, uh, we've seen huge breakups of some of these ice shelves. Uh, this is the Larsen B ice sheet in early 2002, January 2002. Uh, take a look at that mountain for perspective. Here it is in the second shot, which was taken just a couple of months later. An enormous ice sheet, something between the size of Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, breaking off, falling into the ocean, forming thousands of fragmented icebergs. And of course, just as you add ice to a glass of water, uh, that water will, uh, that glass will overflow. Uh, and of course, the, the equivalent of that is sea level rise. Uh, on planet Earth. We have some index of sea level rise already. This is a tide gauge record for Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know who told the harbor master to go out there in 1900 and start measuring it, uh, but it's a wonderful record that shows that sea level's been rising, but the rate of rise has roughly gone up by a factor of four uh, in recent decades. I'd say that something about sea level that's already telling us that the heat is on uh, on planet Earth. This is a map put together by Ben Poulter of the School of Environment at Duke a few years ago, uh, who looked at the Outer Banks of North Carolina, so here's Cape Hatteras and uh, the Outer Banks in Eastern North Carolina, and mapped in blue, uh, in dark blue and light blue, the area of Eastern North Carolina that would be flooded by not the extreme, but the average prediction of sea level rise uh, by mid and uh, later in this century. Uh, you can see vast areas here of eastern North Carolina that are underwater, including all of the outer, outer banks. Uh, I would strongly say that if your family has a tradition of vacationing or whatever on the outer banks, uh, don't plan necessarily on your kids inheriting that beach house. Uh, and if you're thinking of buying a beach house, I'd think twice about it if you want it as a long-term investment. Uh, the, lots of those areas, lots of our coastal areas, uh, are deemed to be flooded. Uh, we can look, I have a similar picture of New York City that shows flooding down in Wall Street. Now, given what's gone on on Wall Street, you may think that might be a good fate for them. Uh, but uh, uh, the impact on urban areas and the bills of the taxpayer uh, that will be expected uh, to be paid to save or uh, otherwise relocate those urban areas is sure to be large. Uh, this is a picture showing drought in the United States, recorded drought since 1900, or actually for the 100 years 1900 to the year 2000. Areas that got drier over that interval are shown in red, uh, red triangles. Areas that got wetter shown in blue triangles. 
Uh, most of the eastern U.S. is predicted to get uh, somewhat wetter. And I'd only encourage you to say that's, that's the recent record of real climate uh, data for rainfall. Uh, this is a model prediction for the future, again, showing areas that get drier are shown in uh, reds, oranges, and increasing brown, areas that are predicted to get wetter in various shades of blue and purple. And you see a further onset of that southwestern drought, a further persistence of slightly wetter conditions uh, in the eastern U.S. Uh, you also see major droughts through here, uh, Central Europe and the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the drought in the central plains of the U.S. should be of enormous concern to every citizen of this planet in terms of the price of food, uh, the, the corn crop, the wheat crop, uh, that will be reflected in Kroger's and Harris Teeter and every time uh, one goes and buys a loaf of bread or buys uh, meat, beef, that has been fed uh, corn. Uh, our impact or the impact of climate just on the, on the lower 48 will be ramified throughout the world in terms of food prices. This is a map of the distribution of the corn borer uh, today in the United States showing an increasing shades of reddish brown areas that can expect to get attacked in any particular year up to the darkest shade of brown which means that 24 years out of 24 you can expect this uh, pest of the corn crop and a map on the right here that shows the anticipated distribution of that uh, corn pest uh, later in this century. And you see that it's moved consistently and uh, quite dramatically up through Iowa and Illinois and other areas uh, that are the central focus of our corn crop. And so not only can we expect drought to affect our food supply, but the impact on climate and the determin determinant that climate plays in the distribution of pests and insects uh, is certain to play out across this country and across the shelves of every grocery store. This is a map showing in areas of green, areas that are presently not suitable for malaria that are anticipated to become suitable uh, by the middle of this century. And those of you in the front, the rest of you will have to trust me, will see that along the, go the Gulf Coast and the eastern coast of the U.S. here, areas that today do not harbor malaria. If you walked into an emergency room with malaria type features, uh, the attendants there might not even have that on their radar screen of things to think about, uh, but areas in which the distribution of malaria may become a commonplace uh, phenomenon. Uh, so not only are we thinking about pests for crops, but we're thinking about diseases uh, that may affect uh, humans directly. I was trained early on as a plant ecologist interested in soil chemistry and the distribution of things relative to climate. And th this is one of my favorite slides of impact. Uh, because it shows in the top half of this graph the distribution of forest trees in the eastern United States today. You can really look at the red, the green, and the blue down here. Those are the important ones to notice. The red is beech maple forest. I had grown up in Cleveland, so I have a particular fondness for maple syrup and maple sugar candy. Uh, but uh, it extends throughout the Midwest and up here in New England. The green is essentially the oak hickory forest that is characteristic and dominant over so much of the Smoky Mountains. And the blue is essentially uh, one or more of the southern pine forests that are planted so widely down in the coastal plain of the east and gulf coasts of the US. Bottom slide here is the distribution of forests anticipated in the year 2060 merely with the change in anticipated temperature alone. So the logic goes trees are distributed according to temperature today, the physiology of trees uh, fixed today evolutionarily is likely to persist in uh, the short period of time. Therefore, trees will be, will, will essentially differ in their distribution uh, in the future. You'll notice that beech and maple are totally lost in New England and the mid Midwest. Uh, in the lower 48, uh, they're likely to be found only out in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, the blue, the southern pines here, uh, have uh, no longer dominate the forests of the coastal plain. Uh, you'd find those as dominant forest dominance out in Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas. Uh, and the eastern U.S. is predicted widely to be covered by an oak hickory savanna. I would argue that any person who currently is employed by, uh, owns stock in, or manages a forest products company that for so long have planted uh, plantations 
of southern pine of one uh, species or another uh, throughout the southeastern U.S. Uh, you need to be taking this seriously. The trees you plant today uh, may very well be the ones that are not either not able to grow there or not grow uh, at high levels of productivity uh, late in this century. Uh, and of course, that's a, that, that is a business with a long-term perspective on planting and future shareholder value and harvest. And so these kinds of things in crops and disease and in forest products uh, that are so important to this region uh, show us that we tweak the climate or we allow the climate to change uh, only at our economic peril and with the potential loss of things that are important to us and potentially threatening to us in our livelihood. A British survey, the Stern Report, uh, not uh, paid for by British Petroleum or not paid for by the British government, uh, concluded that essentially the cost of inaction uh, was vastly in excess of the cost of taking action on some of these problems today. And yet up to now, it seems that in this country and in many countries around the world, the enthusiasm uh, for taking significant action to reduce the concentrations of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere has been lacking. People somehow hope to wake up tomorrow that this was all a bad dream and the carbon dioxide will turn downward in its concentration and the planet will be to cool or perhaps we can do uh, something about shooting uh, satellites into the stratosphere uh, with reflective materials to cool the planet. Uh, that somehow we can continue on our use of carbon-based fossil fuels without altering this basic characteristic of Earth that has been so stable for so long at a level that's been favorable for human use. Um, I would argue that it is highly unlikely that this problem is going to go away all by itself. It's not going to go away without a lot of enthusiasm and effort, and it's not going, going to go away without a significant cost to every citizen of the planet. The reason we're wedded to carbon-based fossil fuels is they have been abundant and they have been relatively inexpensive and our society has been built uh, and the well-being of our economy and our, our uh, own personal feeling of well-being has been built on the idea of cheap, abundant energy in the form of fossil fuels. Anything else we do, which is either not on the, on the, the table and available today, or we know about it but we're not using it because we know it's more expensive than fossil fuels, those are going to cost money. Um, but we need to take this seriously because there's a huge cost to society, to our fellow citizens and ourselves uh, by essentially not taking action and allowing carbon dioxide to continue build up in the Earth's atmosphere. Thank you. Next speech is John Christie. Thank you, John. Someone's, uh, oh, you are. It's a pleasure to be here in North Carolina. I enjoy uh, being this part of the world. Turns out my great-great-grandfather happened to be uh, Sergeant Wa George Washington Short from the 48th North Carolina Company E, which was uh, not far from here. But that's a long time ago. We're talking about climate change now, and things have changed since he was around. And I like to call it climate change by the numbers, and you'll see why. Now here's a quote I, I love. Just because an idea appeals to a lot of people doesn't mean it ro it's wrong. But that's a good working hypothesis. And that was from John Tierney, a New York Times environmental reporter. Michael Crichton said this best, consensus is not science. You hear a lot of things about, but the consensus of scientists says this, that, or the other. Consensus is a political notion. It's not a scientific notion. But 150 years ago, uh, Lord Thompson did tell us what it was. All science is numbers. So I'll show you quantitative information tonight uh, because that is what I am as a, as a climate scientist. This is a typical picture you see of global temperatures. That's a surface temperature measurement. It's very inadequate and prone to error, but it does show a rise in the last 30 years. And as was mentioned by Bill, 38% uh, of the CO, uh, CO2 has risen 38%. That's a rate rise of about 0.6 
percent per year. Here are some other basics. Carbon dioxide is essential for all of life. It is plant food in its best definition. In fact, 16% of the world food production due to, is due to the extra CO2 we have put back into the atmosphere where it used to be millions of years ago. That's a great benefit when you think about it. And the climate is always changing. So the global temperature is never steady. It's either rising or falling. Sea level is rising or falling as our glaciers retreating or advancing. So what we do in the science that I'm in, the, the specific climate science, is we test hypotheses about global warming. And we at our university actually build from scratch the kind of data sets that are necessary to test these assertions that are made primarily by climate models. So here was one of the first ones 20 years ago. James Hansen appeared before a Senate committee and said, this is what the temperature is going to do based on his climate model. The orange and the red were if sort of business as usual scenarios. It's actually gone up more than that in terms of CO2. The yellow one, if you can see it, is uh, if we take draconian cuts in carbon emissions, drastic reductions in energy. It's 20 years later, we have global data sets now that can test this theory, and this is what they show. That that theory, that hypothesis, was statistically significantly wrong. We can call it a failed hypothesis, and I show that today because the same kind of sensitivities in that model that James Hansen used are used in the models today, and that's why they don't predict too well. This is our satellite-based uh, measurement of the global temperature, and it's much less, it does have a warming trend, and I think part of that is due to carbon dioxide, but it's much less than the scary scenarios that you hear about all the time. These are hard numbers, published, gone through the ringer of scientific review uh, tremendously. Let's go to another test. These are four different climate models. On the left of each box is the South Pole, on the right is the North Pole, the tops the stratosphere. So it's like a cross section from pole to pole of the atmosphere. Climate models, and this is uniform in them, say that if you want to find the greenhouse effect signal, go to the tropics and there you see a hot spot that I've identified there in those four models. That that is where you will see clearly the global warming effect if it is due to greenhouse gases as climate models have. As you see here, it's kind of a cluttered picture, but the red line is the trend in the vertical from the models. What you see in the blue line is from actual observations. And so here again, the test in this fundamental quantity that climate models are supposed to get right shows the test fails. Let's go to California. Squeeze down the region here. You see here, this is very typical of all the model results there that the Sierra Nevada mountains warm up much more rapidly than the lowlands. We actually built a climate data, set, data sets, and these are very difficult to build, by the way, but anyway, this is a result published a couple years ago. Actually, in the valley, the temperature has risen dramatically. In the mountains, where the greenhouse signal is supposed to be most dramatic, there's none there at all. This is true for the snowfall, the river, the temperature, everything in the Sierras. We see no change over the last 100 years. Now, why is that valley warming so much, though? Here's a satellite photo in the summertime. The Central Valley is green there because of agriculture. It's supposed to be a desert. I grew up in Fresno, California. I know it's a desert, but because of irrigation, it has changed the surface development. The surface development has just changed the temperature in California. So if you want to return the climate back to what it was, you have to depopulate the valley and return it to a desert. That would be the quickest and best way that you could return the climate to what it was before. Let's go to the southeast where we are. Not one single climate model that we've been able to find has been able to reproduce the cooling that has occurred in the southeastern U.S. over the last 115 years. It's a little known fact, evidently, but uh, the temperatures in our part of the world have declined in the last 115 years. Uh, that happens to be the temperature for North Alabama that you can see when your grandpa tells you about the 20. 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and early 50s, it was really hot back then. Let's go to a more fundamental issue about testing climate models. The, by far, the dominant greenhouse effect is produced by water vapor and clouds. Carbon dioxide is that other bar there. It is rising, as Dr. Schlesinger said. There's no question about that. And the effect of CO2 itself has to occur. It must increase the radiative heat forcing on the system. That's just what it does from simple physics. The question is, what happens to the big 
greenhouse component of the real atmosphere. Climate models are the red there. They say that that increases even more, so that CO2 has this added effect, this positive feedback from uh, uh, the uh, climate models from the clouds and so on. But what if in nature there is actually a mitigating effect? that when you warm up the system, something happens with clouds and water vapor that actually cools the Earth. Well, my colleague Roy Spencer actually builds data sets to answer specifically that question, and here's what he found. On the left are over a thousand climate model runs about how this feedback works. In every case, those climate models said, when you warm up the air with carbon dioxide, the clouds, or anything, anything, doesn't have to be carbon dioxide, the clouds feed back even more warming. Now, it's a little odd because it's on the left, but that means more warming on the left. The real observed data is on the right. Not one single model can reproduce the fact that when you warm up the atmosphere, clouds respond in such a way as to allow the planet to cool. These are hard measurements from global orbiting satellites that we have. So, when you take the Theoretical climate models on the pink, you see this rapid warming over the next hundred years. When you take the empirical models, and these are many different people that have done them, the empirical models based upon real data, you find uh, much, much, much less warming that occurs as a result of this uh, uh, CO2 increase. What about polar regions and polar bears? This is always a popular topic. This is a, a time series, the last 1,500 years of the um, Arctic, I believe, in, in, in the uh, um, Russian Arctic, and what you see is ups and downs and so on, and sure enough, in this particular picture, I'll, I'll point at the bottom one here, you see a rise sort of in the last hundred years, but it starts from the coldest point in the last 1,500 years, and it's certainly not as warm as it was even a thousand years ago when uh, change is more rapid and higher occurred, so naturally the world can make a warming Arctic. If you go back 10,000 years ago, this is the Greenland ice core record, you see that 1,000 years ago, that peak right there, right there. But here you see a 4,000 year period in which the climate did not, or, or Greenland was much warmer than it is today, and Greenland did not melt. That's an important point. Greenland did not melt when for 4,000 years it was much warmer than it is today. Let's go further south now. Uh, this is the equator, East Africa. I, I lived there for a while. And uh, Kilimanjaro certainly has been losing ice, as you can see in this bottom lower left. It's 1880. It has uh, lost quite a bit, nearly all of it actually, since uh, first recorded in 1880. And it shows you that, that glaciers are pretty bad thermometers, as it turns out. They're not very good at telling you the temperature because so many things affect them. But I did build a data set, it took a lot of effort, of East African temperatures the last 100 years. This will be published in about three months. It shows no temperature change there in East Africa, despite what you have been told about uh, certainly Kilimanjaro's melting because of temperature rises, that's not happening. It's melting because of other reasons that happen in that part of the world. Let's go to the far south, the Antarctic sea ice here. It, uh, there's a lot of sea ice in the winter time, so it's high, then it goes down the next year in the summer, and then up winter, down summer, and so on. Sea ice expands and contracts each year. Uh, Two weeks after the Arctic reached its lowest sea ice extent in September of 2007, the Antarctic reached its maximum extent, so that when you added them together, the globe had the same amount of sea ice that it had 30 years ago. So the sea ice in the last uh, period has been, or last 30 years has been expanding. Polar bears, people like to talk about polar bears, and they were declining in population. In 1960s, they were down to six to 10,000 is all there were. It was mainly due to the introduction of snowmobiles and high-powered rifles. But two Marine Mammal Protection Acts were enacted, and that set quotas and really saved the day for the polar bears. And today, there are 24,200 at one estimate. You could probably do that plus or minus 2,000 on that. And Canada allows 800 legal kills per year of their polar bears to keep their populations healthy. They do that based upon a scientific analysis of um, uh, the evidence there. So they're pretty upset that the United States has put the polar bears on threatened species because to them they are not. Uh, so scientifically speaking, polar bears are not threatened species. Sea level will rise rapidly as Greenland melts. Sea level has been rising all the time, long time since the last ice age, and it's rising at about one inch per decade right now. 
the one inch per decade is not your problem. It's the 20 feet that comes in six hours with the next hurricane. That's your problem. And if you are able to withstand that, you can take care of climate change, which means I tell my people who want to build on the Alabama Gulf Coast, that's not a smart thing to do because another hurricane will come. There's just no doubt about that. But sea level has not been rising in an accelerated manner. You see, this is the latest results. Sea level uh, has been flat, actually, for the last three years uh, from the satellite measurements of sea level. So these notions that sea level is rising at an increasing rate just do not pan out. In fact, the Landsat images of Bangladesh shows that it has increased in land area. It's an alluvial plain uh, over the last 32 years. It is not going away. Bangladesh is not drowning. And Greenland was warmer in the past, and it did not melt. Dangerous weather is becoming more frequent and more intense. I hear that a lot at global warming uh, seminars and so on. We can count tornadoes. All science is numbers. We can count tornadoes. They are not increasing in frequency or intensity. Hurricanes are not increasing in intensity or frequency. In fact, this is a, a global view, and a blue line is a northern hemisphere. We have good measurements now, the northern hemisphere hurricane activity. It actually reached its all-time low just a, a few months ago uh, in terms of intensity. So, so far, I've shown that global surface temperature is rising, but in a way inconsistent with model projections. Sea ice, uh, sea level is rising because ice is melting, uh, but it's only one inch per decade, and severe weather is not becoming more frequent or extent. But I want to talk about energy for my last part here. Please don't demonize energy, because without energy, life is brutal and short. Without energy, life is brutal and short. Uh, I was a missionary in Africa. I taught at Neary Baptist High School, physics and chemistry for the students there. Great time, wonderful experience, because the people were, uh, meant so much to me at that point. I want to show you their energy system. They look at a forest. That's the energy. The energy transmission system are the backs of women. The UN estimates 3.1 miles a day, one way. Put about 45 pounds of wood on the back. They chop take it back. And here's the tragic part. I hope you can see it in the bottom ones. The energy use, it's burned wood in their homes. And I hope you can see that smoke there because I've been in many homes like this in Africa. The UN estimates between 1.8 million and 5.2 million children die each year because of that energy system. You and I would not stand for that. But that's what they're living with now and they're not going to stand for it either. And I want you to know this. One thing I did learn while living in Africa, that African parents love their children as much as you and I do. And African parents, and I've seen this, grieve deeply whenever their child is lost. They're not going to stand for that. And I'm not telling you that story to, to, to move your heartstrings, but to tell you that the demand for energy is going to rise. It's just going to happen because energy, without energy, life is brutal and short. So now we have a dilemma. Suppose you don't agree with me at all about what climate change is, but you say, I want to do something about climate change, global warming or whatever. At the same time, reduce CO2 emissions and meet significant growth in energy demand. Energy demand is going to rise. I'll tell you what California did. They forced a limit on emissions from light duty vehicles. AB 1493 was the code and it was supposed to make 43 mile per gallon cars by 2016. 11 northeastern states adopted it. There was a trial in federal court, Burlington, Vermont, in April and May 2007. I appeared as an expert witness for the Alliance for Automobile Manufacturers. I did it for free. I took vacation to do this. So I, I, I paid for my uh, ability to be part of this trial. And uh, because it was an interesting scientific question for me. Oh, uh, what happens? Well, my, the bulk of my testimony, the guts of my testimony was this. Let's assume that's going to be the temperature rise for the next 100 years. I don't believe it. The data already show this is too high, it's wrong. But let's assume that's going to happen. That's what happens when the entire country puts this AB 1493 into place. Let me back it up. I'm going to overlay, not take off, overlay the effect if the entire country adopts this bill. It's less than a hundredth of a degree after 100 years. No effect, in other words. In fact, if the entire world adopted this program, this bill, it would be undetectable at three hundredths of a degree. Global temperature changes by that, more than that from day to day. The judge ruled the law was legal, but that's because they were dealing mainly with, um, with um, 
uh, uh, states' rights versus federal rights, you know, who has the right to make pollution controls and cafe standards and so on. So the climate wasn't the driving force, but the climate was the intent of the bill. But yet the judge still said, plaintiff's expert Dr. Christie estimated that implementing the regulations across the entire United States would reduce global temperature by about a hundredth of a degree, by 2100. Hansen and Jim Hansen testified on behalf of the other side. Hansen did not contradict that testimony. What I said, both sides agreed, the judge agreed, the bill has no impact at all on the climate. Now, we'll raise your car price about $4,000 a car, but it has no impact on the climate. I ask a question also in this trial, what could make a dent? Is there anything that we could do? So let's build a thousand nuclear power plants. John McCain campaigned on the issue of building 45. So this is a thousand. It's not going to happen, okay? But we can do the experiment to see what it would mean. And these are big ones, 1.4 gigawatts each. Let's do the experiment again. A thousand nuclear power plants by 2020, and this is what it is. It's a dent. I had to build a thousand just to get a dent of seven hundredths of a degree. Now we might want to go to nuclear power for many other reasons, but to control the climate, uh, uh, we can't. We can't control the climate. Was that two or three, John? Three, <laughs> okay. Um, so the main points are without energy, life is brutal and short. Proposed do something about global warming initiatives will not detectably alter whatever the climate is going to do. So tell me what your initiative, issue, your initiative is and I will test it. I will, I will figure out what it can do. Making energy more expensive is a regressive tax and stops economic development. Uh, clearest example, Alabama is growing in manufacturing because of our inexpensive energy. Uh, a plant manager, owner, actually said to me, he said, John, if our price for electricity goes up anymore, um, we're moving. He said, Alabama is our last stop in this country. We're taking our whole manufacturing enterprise to Mexico. Of course, the ironic thing about that is a law that's designed to clean the air just makes it dirtier because the plant they build in Mexico is going to be much more polluting than they would uh, actually hold here. But for Alabama, it means we lose all those jobs and people lose their health care, their education opportunities, and so on. So making energy more expensive is not the way to go if you uh, want to see uh, things improve in terms of economic development. This was a 500-page bill that came out last year. I'd just say about it. The greatest climate change threat to the U.S. is not the variations of its physical climate. Uh, that really hasn't changed in 100 years. Uh, but the impact on its economy from climate change regulations. I want to paraphrase my physics teacher from way back in high school. We should always begin our scientific assessments with this statement. At our present level of ignorance, we think we know. I want to get this point across to you. Our ignorance about the climate system is enormous. And you and our policymakers need to know that. This is an extremely complex system. And to understand it and think we can predict it is uh, a little bit of hubris in my mind. And so when those people who say, I am confident I know how the world works, I am confident I know that CO2 does this to the climate or so on, they don't know how complicated the system is. And to them, I say just a very simple thing, if you know so much about the climate system, then why can't you predict it? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we now have a 10-minute response from uh, Dr. Schlesinger. This may be as much fun as uh, Obama and McCain. Uh, so, John, uh, you know, uh, I got to disagree with you on a lot of subjects. Um, I'd say when a climate bill or a proposal to do nothing about this issue is criticized that it will have no effect, that it will be a trivial effect. Uh, that's because we're being unrealistic about the magnitude of the problem and what ought to, in fact, be done. We have not taken uh, the seriousness of this issue, the, the difficulty uh, that this is going to present us uh, at all serious, uh, seriously, and we need to do so uh, before we get a level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is irretrievable. Uh, in terms of its impact on the climate. And the second thing I'd like to point out is that while you spend a fair amount of time criticizing climate models, in fact, a huge amount of time criticizing climate models, it's a climate model itself uh, that allowed you to make those uh, statements 
that you believe that uh, only a small amount of impact will be seen on the temperature if we take action A or action B. Um, so essentially, you're using a number of the techniques uh, that you find are uh, wrought with a level of ignorance uh, and, uh, and, and uh, lack of, of confidence in them. Nevertheless, I think it's important that you acknowledge that in fact the planet is warming and your data show that uh, widely, uh, that there is a CO2 effect on the planet's warming. Uh, I would differ with you in the sense that uh, the quote of Michael Crichton, Michael Crichton is a fiction writer, uh, for him to say anything about science or scientific consensus uh, I think is totally inappropriate. It would be as inappropriate as my saying that I was going to go off and write a best-selling work of fiction, which is truly fictional. Um, the IPCC is probably the largest effort for scientists around the world, 2,500 of them, to get together and argue out the state of our knowledge on how the world's climate system works and what the impact of carbon dioxide would be on that climate. You were part of that. The, I'd say there's been more consensus in that group than the consensus 40 years ago that cigarettes caused lung cancer. And yet we took action on cigarettes ca causing lung cancer, uh, starting off with, with warnings and labels and increasing of taxes and the like. Um, and I think we're all very glad that we did so. The waiting for yet another climate model to get the 10th the degree agreement with this is like a cancer patient that has had nine opinions in one direction and says, oh, I must get a 10th opinion uh, before I consider some kind of treatment there. That's inappropriate in the face of the kinds of threats that this planet faces uh, from climate change and rising CO2. I want to spend a little bit of time on rising CO2 uh, simply by itself. A number of people for a number of years have said that carbon dioxide, CO2, rising in Earth's atmosphere is the best thing uh, since sliced bread. It's a raw material for photosynthesis at what makes, makes plants grow. There's no doubt that carbon dioxide is what makes plants grow. They take carbon dioxide out of the air and they convert it into the carbon of their tissues. But there's a limit to what carbon dioxide does uh, in terms of stimulating plant growth. And at the rate we are adding it to the atmosphere, it is likely that we will achieve levels on the order of 700 parts per million late in this century that have been shown to be clearly deleterious to plant growth, particularly of crop plants. They have so much photosynthate in their cells that the chloroplasts actually explode from the accumulation of starch grains within them. Uh, that will be a huge detriment to global yield. And notice at that time when we've achieved those levels, there'll be very little we can do about lowering the carbon dioxide concentration uh, in the atmosphere. So it's fine to say that carbon dioxide may, uh, may have, in the past, uh, caused plants to grow a little faster, and it may today, or next spring, cause them to grow yet a little bit more faster. But there is a limit to that, and we approach that limit and beyond it at our peril of food supply. I was in charge of the experiment in Duke Forest that ran for 10 years where we exposed a large area of forest nearly the size of this room in replicate plots to high carbon dioxide. We essentially added carbon dioxide uh, to those plots of forest to simulate the concentration globally in the year 2050. The trees grew a little bit faster, about 10 or 12 percent faster. Extrapolated globally, that would take up about 10 percent of the emissions that the world will have in the year 2050. So it makes a small but relatively trivial, trivial uh, impact on the climate change and carbon dioxide problem. Meanwhile, we saw a number of disturbing uh, features of that forest growth. The production of pollen by the pines roughly tripled. This has now been seen in a wide variety of weeds uh, in lab experimental results that have shown a huge increase in pollen production. And so for all of you that suffer from hay fever, or more seriously, emphysema or asthma, rising CO2 is probably the worst thing you can hear about in terms of respiratory disease. This will be the global atmospheric bath for plants 
as the century unfolds. Beyond that, while the pine trees grew about 12% faster in our forest, consistently for the first seven years of the experiment, I haven't seen the data for the last three, uh, but consistently for the first seven years of the experiment, poison ivy was the champion species in the forest and showed roughly a 70% growth increase. Not only were the plants that much larger, but the toxicant, the allergen per gram of leaf tissue uh, roughly doubled. This is one of the earliest findings that has shown a number of changes in plant chemistry, in drug plant chemistry, uh, and in this case, a allergenic uh, plant compound that will have huge and significant and costly human impacts uh, as this century unfolds. This is just a direct carbon dioxide effect, not a carbon dioxide effect uh, played out uh, through the eyes of temperature. So I would say that uh, I, I got a couple of uh, things that I've noticed on this. Well, I want to make one other point here. Um, throughout your talk, you said a number of things as direct statements that I would take issue with individually. The IPCC climate models are wrong. Um, they may not be perfect. They may not be as good as they will be in 10 years. But this is the best that 2,500 scientists from around the world thought they could do when they got together to discuss where we were. And the conclusion of that entire report is that humans were having an effect on climate and the effect was likely to get worse and have significant impacts as the century unfolded. The Greenland ice pack did not melt. We have all kinds of, well, the thousand years ago or four thousand years ago. We have all kinds of evidence that it's melting and melting more rapidly now than it used to. And all the ice that melts that is not today floating on the sea surface adds water to the ocean and causes sea level to rise. Uh, the comment that sea level is flat for the last three years, this seems to go in the face of all the work of climatologists that should convince all of us that looking at a one, two, three, even five year record of a climate variable is meaningless. These are long term variables and we're dealing with long term change here. And to suggest that a, a, the last three years of sea level being uh, relatively flat, in other words, not increasing uh, or decreasing very much, uh, essentially violates that same rule. I would conclude then that looking at, at your talk, we should not demonize energy. We should demonize fossil energy that's derived from carbon. There are lots of alternatives out there. Homo sapiens is an intelligent species, a bright young chemical uh, engineers ought to be able to deal with this problem. Roughly half of our energy use uh, in electricity uh, can be dealt with simply by improvements of efficiency that go right to the bottom line of either you or me or the corporation using energy. No excuse for not doing that other than energy has been so cheap because the impacts of climate have not been factored in uh, that we've never been motivated to do so. Wind, wind power, where you can generate it, is roughly at the same price of coal-fired power plants. Uh, the solar has a number of attractive options uh, that I think should be pursued. And people have referred to the southeastern U.S. as the Saudi Arabia of biomass. We have enormous potential to grow, to let plants, because they take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, to let them help mitigate the problem by taking up carbon dioxide, fix, fixing it into plant biomass or cellulose, and using that to generate biofuels that can replace the fossil fuels that are the source of this problem. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, like to, I always hear this IPCC thing thrown around. It's called an argument from authority. If you're the guy that's actually built the data sets from scratch, it doesn't matter if there's a hundred guys out there that say something else. You look at the authority of the data, not the models, not the theory, but the data themselves. I was on the IPCC. I was a lead author. I can assure you, I can assure you it was a political the, the, the people that were selected for the IPCC were selected by their governments. Right there, you know, it's a political thing. And, and it's becoming more so, evidently, because you can only be on there if you have the certain views. So it is not surprising at all 
when you pre-select those who will be writing the report, that the report comes out the way it is. Um, I'm getting old, I need these things. Uh, just a, a few things here. I was trying to listen as well as, as think about saying this. Um, the most rapid rate Greenland melted was in 2005. I took that rate of 2005. It's really slowed down since then, by the way. And that is a one and a half inches per century. If Greenland melted at the most rapid race, rate we have observed it in the past 10 years. Um, and that three years, the last three years of sea level, I showed that because you hear the statement that sea level is increasing or accelerating. The second derivative of that curve is not positive. This is a decreasing uh, uh, trend on that. But it could turn back up. There, there, I'm not saying it's not going to do that. Michael Crichton does know about science. He has an MD. He was a postdoc at Scripps, at, at UC San Diego Med School. He knows about science. And, and I can assure you, having been on many of those panels, consensus is not science. Um, Stern reports, uh, uh, you know, in, in the world where I live in, those kind of exercises really don't match. I think the best person to work on that is a fellow named Bjorn Lomborg, who did exactly the kind of, if we spend a dollar, this is how much gain we have. This is the cost, this is the benefit. And it turns out things like spending dollars on uh, micronutrients for children in Africa give you about $200 for every dollar spent. Spending it on CO2, and he accepted uh, many of the Stern Review's things, gets you back about 50 cents. So it is not a cost benefit in that term. Um, I don't, you, you mentioned that sea level rose by a factor of four recently. That, that's the one I just don't know where that came from. Um, the drought is not increasing in the United States. If you go into the West and go back a thousand years with our records we have now, it was tremendously worse back in the 12th century and other centuries. And that, that's very clear from all the records that we have. So the situation in the United States is not getting worse in terms of drought or, or floods or anything. Uh, when it comes to corn or something, I hope you already saw that the picture that he showed about the corn borer moving up, that's already wrong because the sea level, I mean the temperature in the southeast has declined in the last hundred years, unlike models are able to predict. But even so, I deal with farmers a lot because as a state climatologist, in Alabama you can grow 240 acre corn now. They're, they used to be 30, you know, a hundred years ago. They're looking for 300 bushels an acre coming up in the next few years. We have the technology to overcome these kinds of things that we see. There's something called advancement and adaptability and, and learning that is embodied in what we are able to do with uh, these kinds of uh, technologies with uh, growing things. Uh, you know, the world food production has not declined. It is still going up, and I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, I want to save that one for the last point here. Uh, I like the one about poison ivy. It's always fun to mention poison ivy without mentioning the fact one-sixth of our, uh, our plant food supply for humans has increased as a result of CO2. You think about what that means in the world food supply. One-sixth of it. I don't know if I can take five minutes here. I'm almost to the end. Um, what? Oh, well, yeah, he, he gave me the five more minute sign. Um, we test models. You can claim all you want about a model, but to us, to a scientist, a model is a hypothesis. It's something that needs to be tested. And we are one of the few groups in the world that is capable of creating the kind of data sets from the digital counts on satellites or dusty records in a London archive or something like that to specifically test. You know, without saying yay or nay, whether you like models or not like them, let's test them. And when we test them, they fail time and time again, as I showed you just a few examples of that in the most fundamental parts, by the way, of what the models are. Um, Malaria. Malaria used to be endemic to the Arctic Circle. The temperature is not the characteristic there, it's public health infrastructure. When they built the Erie Canal, a malaria was part of the real problem in keeping the thing going in the summertime up in New York. That's how far malaria used to be, but public health infrastructure, wealth that countries have, is how you take care of malaria. Um, so, let me just say in conclusion here, that um, I don't want to demonize carbon-based energy. You and I are likely alive today because of carbon-based energy. When my uh, three-year-old grandson comes up, hugs me around the knees and says, I love you, Grandpa, I would not have had that experience 100 years ago when the average lifespan of Americans was 47 years old. 
So when you talk about carbon-based energy, you are talking about life. You are talking about your life and my life because without that kind of energy, we wouldn't have it. Are we going, now I want to end optimistically here. Uh, are we going to have new energies, different non-carbon-based energies? Yes, I think so. Our initiative, you know, this country is built on innovation and initiative and so on, and we are able to do that because we have the freedom to question and ask and, and, and pull the curtain back on, on assertions that certain people make and, and agendas they might have. So I'm very optimistic that um, some energy thing will be cracked. I don't know what it is. Maybe it will be nuclear. Maybe it will be fusion-based nuclear power or whatnot. But that uh, we will decarbonize our energy supply in the next hundred years, just like we dehorsified transportation in the last hundred years. When you think about it, burning coal is kind of 19th century, you know. And so, you know, turning uh, energy into electricity and the more higher functions of energy are going to be quite good and, uh, and, and progressive. And I'm optimistic. Normally, people like me aren't optimistic about biofuels, but, but uh, Schles Dr. Schlesinger was correct that in the southeast, we can turn carbon dioxide and sunlight and water into stuff, you know, in, into biomass. And um, with, kind of, with the initiatives I've seen going on in Alabama, and certainly they would apply to the southeast in general, we can create a lot of renewable biomass if we can just crack the cost a little bit more. It's not going to take too much more. But, uh, and a few other problems uh, that can be handled, I think. But uh, biomass, I think, is an optimistic way to end, uh, as well as the alternatives that will come because they are affordable. If you make energy expensive, then you're hurting yourself. But come up with those affordable alternatives, and we all win, I think. Okay, folks, uh, so now uh, if you would just pass any questions that you have on those index cards, pass them to uh, the center aisles and there'll be people around to pick those up. And also remind you about those surveys. Uh, if you would, please uh, fill, fill those out so we can get a sense of how this event went and also about how influential these uh, two uh, really fantastic scientists have been in elucidating this, uh, this topic for us. So uh, we'll take about a five minutes to uh, collect your questions and uh, then we'll, we'll get started again. Okay, so uh, some of these questions are just sort of general, others are directed at uh, particular uh, speakers. So uh, uh, Dr. Christie, uh, why do the models fail? A model is a set of rules. If you've written computer code, you know what I'm talking about. It turns out those rules don't explain or, or quantify the way the real world works. It's very complicated. And, uh, and, and so that, that's, I suppose, is a simple answer. It's such a complicated system that the rules that are in these climate models do not express reality uh, well enough to uh, make these kind of forecasting projections. Dr. Schlesinger, of the uh, 2,500 members of the IPCC, how many are climate scientists, not political scientists, economists, sociologists, or other? <laughs> there's, actually, there's a huge range of different disciplines represented there. I, I, I'm going to have to give you a guess um, that something on the order of 20 percent have some dealing with climate. Uh, Dr. Christie, at what point in time will we know which one of you or Dr. Schlesinger is right? And if we are wrong, will we have time to try to counteract global warming in order to maintain biodiversity? Okay, that question goes all over the place. I'll right. just say this. I, I need a quantitative test uh, that, that's mentioned here. Right or wrong doesn't cut it in a, in a scientific thing. Uh, when will climate models reproduce the actual temperature rise we see and give some kind of sense of whether they're right, I suppose that would be, when, when they are consistent with the observations. Okay, do the, do the climate models get any of it right? Um, well, they get the fact it's warmer in summer and cooler in winter real well. <laughs> they, um, you know, they get s s the, the gross systems like jet streams, uh, correct in the broad areas of rainfall that occur therein, where the deserts are and so on. You would never use a climate model for regional projection, though. Even the IPCC says that. 
in like the southeast U.S., you would never use a climate model to tell you. I'll just tell you a simple story. The National Academy, or, or someone, did use two climate models. One had the southeast turned into a jungle, and one had it turning into a semi-arid plain. So uh, they've got a lot of work to do. So in modeling circles, is, is the goal really to be able to predict using models and, and as you say, go back and test it with a hypothesis? And are there any modelers who realistically think at some point they will get it right? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty hard question in the sense that climate modelers have this huge pressure on them to tell us what's going to happen in the future. At the same time, they're trying to express fundamental rules of the atmosphere with very crude rules of, of, of the climate model constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think they would not, they'd rather not have that pressure, that they want to be able just to explain what we see in the atmosphere today rather than have that projection uh, placed on their shoulders. Right. Okay. Uh, would the increase in pollen not increase the potential of pines to produce more uh, wilt warming? Karen, am I getting that right? Wilt, wilt warming? Wilt warming. Oh. Uh, it's got to be something else. Something else. <laughs> okay. I thought I knew who asked that question, but. Would the increase of the pine pollen not increase the possibility of the pine tree to be more prolific? Right. Okay. Right. Is not is the pollen not going to improve the biology of the pines? Uh, it could potentially increase seed production, um, but. Uh, you know, you've got to overlay that then on the situation that those seeds, where those seeds will fall and, and the climate that they will experience. Um, if you look at that map of forest cover of the southeastern U.S., pine is predicted widely uh, to not be the most productive or, and not even occur in many areas that it occurs today. For somewhere else, yeah. Uh, there is suspicion that the government plans to institute a tax on cattle due to their ability to increase methane gas in the atmosphere. Uh, bathrooms over there. Uh, is this true, and is it reasonable? And that's to uh, either of our speakers. My. Uh, Roommate in college will be incorporated in that tax as well. <laughs> uh, you know, methane, cows generate methane, and methane is a, is a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. There's a number of people that suggested that we could actually institute policies for methane and nitrous oxide, uh, perhaps easier than carbon dioxide. I would say all for it. Let's, let's, get the most bang for our buck on these kinds of things. Um, but certainly in a full greenhouse gas accord where we were trying to uh, reduce the country's total impact on climate, if a country vastly increased its herd of beef cattle, you'd want to have some kind of acknowledgement of that in terms of, of penalty or carbon tax to, to, uh, to make up for it. How confident are we that we really understand where all the methane comes from on the planet? I think budget is pretty well balanced. There's roughly 500 teragrams uh, produced and consumed every year, somewhere between 500 and 550. So uh, we can balance it fairly accurately within about 10 percent. It has a lifetime of 12 years in the atmosphere. Um, it is not as well known as carbon dioxide, but it's, it's, that's a sophisticated science. Is, is, there some, is there some truth to the uh, idea that termites produce a fair amount of methane? Ter, uh, termites produce methane. It's not uh, even the number one, two, or three largest in the budget, but it's there. Of course, the th thing that you have to ask with that, you know, are therefore termites responsible for global warming? Unless we've had a remarkable increase in termites for some <laughs> reason, uh, they should have no effect at all. You know, there have always been termites, and they've always produced some methane, and and uh, the budget has always had inputs and outputs and termites. Uh, they've got to have changed to make a difference. Okay. Uh, Dr. Christie, has your opinion changed um, any since you signed the AGU position statement? Or was the public, uh, or was the public position statement what you signed? Yes, I helped write the AGU statement from a couple years ago, or four or five years ago. Could you, you could just talk about what the AGU statement is? Hey, it says that uh, 
humans are having an effect on the climate. In fact, my quote on NPR was that it is inconceivable that with the addition of the aerosols that we put in the air, changing forests into farmland and throwing up uh, uh, other things into the air, including greenhouse gases, that the climate in some sense has not changed. That, that was my statement, so to speak. Uh, but, and Marv Geller was our chairman, and he was very clear about this. He said, we're not going to put the number on it. We're not going to quantify it. We just put the sign. In other words, yes, there is warming due to extra greenhouse gases. But we're not going to say how much. And I was very willing to sign that statement because I think the extra CO2 will indeed cause some temperature rise, but not one that we can pin down as a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts about the direct correlation with global temperature and sunspot activity for the past thousands of years? Thousands of years. There, yeah, there is a relationship between solar activity and, broadly speaking, temperature of the planet. The mechanism is still to be figured out. And so just making the sun hotter does not create enough joules of energy to make the system warm. There has to be some other indirect secondary effect that we don't quite know what it is. And so there is research today going on to say, well, if the sunlight goes up a little bit, does it trigger something that causes this sympathetic relationship with the Earth? But there is evidence that uh, there at least is a relationship. Here's a nice uh, factual question, uh, not that these others weren't, um, but uh, what is the best online site to get quantitative global temperature data? Um, and there's a asterisk here, unbiased, actual, and current. Well, I can easily answer that. It's the University of Alabama in Huntsville. <laughs> we have a paper, I think Science Express will be highlighting it to here uh, uh, this week or next week or something, where we once again go through an exercise of independent verification of our satellite work, and it's shown to be, compared with some other data sets, it's shown to be the most faithful to independent measurements. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are others out there, and I am writing the American Meteorological Society's report on upper air temperatures. I have seven data sets in there. Turns out they're all very, very close together. So the planet is warming about 0.14 degrees C per decade right now. Uh, and finally, our last question is to both speakers, so I'd actually like both of you to address this. Uh, what is the biggest challenge you face in communicating uh, climate change or, yeah, climate change to the public? So it's really a question about communication. I got to give two things on that. The first is, and we've seen this tonight, this, this is not simple. Uh, there are very sophisticated models, there are long-term data sets, there's geology involved, um, so that uh, this, is a, this is a very complicated system with a lot of people working on it with different disciplines that don't speak to each other quite well. That's my first response to that. The second is that the public, for one reason or another, has a large number of people represented there that really don't want to believe, regardless of the data, that humans are having an impact on climate. It's a deep-seated belief that this either couldn't possibly be happen, happening, or if it is, it's God's will, uh, and they don't, basically don't want to hear uh, what we often have to say. Okay, John? Oh, from my point of view, I think the most difficult challenge is dealing with a media that is very hard over on trying to alarm you and scare you about scenarios that are being thrust in your face and that every little study that comes along is solid, rock-hard evidence that the world is going to die, we're all going to die. That was expressed to me, by the way, by one of the New York Times reporters, that their editors require them to write stuff that sells newspapers. And mundane, low temperature rate, temperature data sets like ours just don't cross that bar. You have to be scary to get it in the newspaper. And so that is what my biggest challenge is. And who reads the newspapers? Congressmen, because his, his or her constituents read them. And so our legislators are also influenced tremendously by a media that is, that is biased heavily toward that which alarms. 
Okay, well, uh, why don't you join me in uh, thanking our speakers and... Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And again, if you're interested in the John Locke Foundation, uh, just fill out that card. And if you're interested in conservation or environmental issues here in the Hickory area, uh, the Reese Institute for Conservation and Natural Resources at Lenore Ryan University. And, and, leave, and leave any of the material uh, that you're filling out for us at the front table. Thank you.